Welcome everyone. As you can hear, my voice is shredded by the greatest disease known to men, the common cold. And the only reason why I was able to finish this video is the insanely talented creator of the Echoes of Eschaton podcast, Coop the GM, who offered to record the script. So huge freaking shoutouts to you, Coop, and dear viewers, if you haven't checked out his podcast yet, do it immediately after this video. The link is in the description, and now, enjoy. Welcome everybody, to the ninth of hopefully many Degenesis lore drop videos. I'm Coop the GM, and I'm filling in for your regular pain and paper host this video. I run the Echoes of Eshetan podcast, a post-apocalypse solo play podcast set in the world of Degenesis. The Degenesis community has been so kind to me, I wanted to reach out and help pain and paper narrate today's lore drop. So let's dive in. When talking about the Marauder Gusev, we have to start off with a fairly significant reveal. Gusev has been known by two names. In the second Degenesis book, Catharsis, these two names have separate paragraphs in the Marauder chapter, insinuating that they are in fact two separate entities. The first Gusev is a mysterious figure who is connected to the city of Norit, a city southwest of Justitian. Norit is a ghost town where the machine men, the Am Sumos, stalk the ruins, ready to attack any scrapper that dares to set foot inside its walls. It is here where the Marauder Gusev bides his time. His face is bandaged and his aging body struggles with every step as a battle against gravity as he wades through the riverbed at the center of the city. Gusev is said to move amongst the machine men unnoticed. They don't even look at him, which turns the death trap of Norit into a safe haven for the Marauder. Norit has also become the site of an inexplicable amount of biodiversity. Wild wheat grows around the riverbed. Trees bear shining red fruit that no one can harvest and that will inevitably rot in the silt. The same entity known as Gusev and Borka is also known as the Icebreaker in the northern regions of Poland, near the Ice Barrier. He has been visiting the Spital in Danzig once every year for decades, where he demanded the latest research data concerning the Primer and Psychonauts from the Spitalians. They have been providing him with their knowledge since they knew the consequences of disobedience would have been dire. Obeying the Marauder got them rewards once he was satisfied. Artifacts, booklets full of formulas, or an incredibly detailed hand-drawn map of subterranean growths were among his gifts. The Spitalians have profited significantly from their collaboration with the Marauder, while the Chroniclers have tried to monitor his movements across Borka and Poland. They are aware of the Icebreaker's visits to Danzig. Gusev is also one of the Marauders who is confirmed to be carrying a Soul Burner a legendary weapon that shoots beams of burning light capable of vaporizing flesh, bone, and leveling structures. Before the Eshetan, the marauder known as Gusev, the Icebreaker, or the Ghost of Norit, was Recombination Group board member Nikolai Gusev, researcher of nanite-supported stasis, botany, with a specialization in embryology, and genetically adaptive grain agriculture and cryogenics. In comparison to most other marauders, there is not much information included in the early Degenesis books about Nikolai Gusev and his actions before the Eshetan, apart from his profession and the fact that he once held a presentation on nanite-supported stasis during a recombination group think tank meeting that was attended by Nathan Argyre. But from what we do know from later sources, which will be discussed in the heavy spoiler section, we can assume that Gusev's story is a rather classic marauder story. Like the other board members of the recombination group, 
He was provided with a nanite treatment and was ultimately betrayed by RG co-founder Jerome Gattrell. The nanites in his bloodstream failed, and after the Eschaton, he was most probably doomed to hunt for Tannhauser sleepers to keep his body from decaying. The bandages on his face and his body are proof of that. We also know that he opposed the execution of Project Tannhauser and Jerome Gattrell's plans in general. One of his actions, at least tangentially connected to his opposition to Jerome Gattrell, is revealed in the Justician sourcebook, The Righteous Fist. In the chapter about the Spittle, the Spitalian's HQ in Borka, we find a significant passage about the Spitalian chairman, Marbid Ehrensdorf, who is responsible for research concerning information about the cult's origins. This origin information was initially lost due to the collapse of the stream. In minute detail, Arnsdorf and his group were able to transcribe sections rescued from the ashes, salvage tarnished folders, and repair melted data carriers, mapping a somewhat comprehensive diagram of the Spitalian cult that leads all the way back to the cult's founding members who worked in the Southern Ruhr Crisis Center directly after the Eschaton. This crisis center would later be renamed the Spittle. One of the entries in the diagram points to a chairman, one Dr. Nikolai Gusev. Gusev can thus be viewed as a founding member of this battalion cult, even though we cannot be sure how much influence he had on how the cult developed over the following centuries. We know that over 250 years later, Gusev visited the Spittle again, this time as a dark figure clad in rags and bandages. He supplied the reclusive Spitalians with ceramic cartridges filled with entropic nanites which he sourced from his own blood over the past decades, and pointed their attention toward the blooming Mother Sporefield of Minden. It seems that Gusev sought out the Spitalians in hope of finding a cure for the failing nanites inside his own body. The cooperation between the Marauder and the Cult is continued across the centuries and is only intensified during the period of the City Wars, which will be discussed later. What the Marauder did during the time between his work in the Southern Ruhr Crisis Center and his first contact with the Spitalian Cult in the year 2312 is shrouded in mystery. Yet some assumptions can be made that lead us directly to the city of Norit. Norit is Gusev's domain and we know that he can move freely among the Amsumos, who attack all scrappers that dare to enter the city. Gusev is allowed to walk the ruins of Norit unmolested, most probably because he is in possession of a so-called Subsumo Transponder, an artifact that causes the Amsumos on guard to consider the bearer one of their own. This makes Norit one of the safest places in the world for the Marauder. We also know that one reason why Gusev went to Norit was that he tried to reprogram the Amsumo army stationed there, since he knows that a restart of the stream would retrigger old recombination group combat programs lying dormant inside the Metal Warriors. Gatrell's orchestra of final human selection would begin its symphony. The Marauder most probably failed in his initial attempt, but he took to teaching others the dangers of restarting the stream. Together with the marauder Aspera, Gusev supported the Chronicler cult in their darkest hour and provided the streamers with valuable information, not only on sleeper infiltrators inside Chronicler ranks, but also about the consequences of restarting the stream. Norit was also the place where the recombination group had one of its major pharmaceutical headquarters, and we will hear more about this in the heavy spoiler section. We can assume that the recombination group facilities in Norit gave Gusev enough materials for his botanical experiments, which he continued and maybe even intensified after the Eschaton. These were the cause for Norit's seemingly inexplicable biodiversity. The area of miraculous flora of Norit also gives Gusev another title, the Constant Gardener. He used his ingenuity to develop seeds that would adapt to the charred environment of the post eschaton world.
In the paler chapter of the first to Genesis book, Primal Punk, we can find a peculiar piece of information that reveals more about Gusev's actions before and after the Eshetan. This section describes how paler revivals in search of recombination group dispensers to open came across a mysterious drawing that showed a type of dispenser that no paler had ever seen before. Apparently, the word Gusev was engraved in it as well as the number 12 of 44. Coordinates connected to the drawing pointed to a location in Norit, right in the middle of the machine men's territory. To make sense of these findings, we have to take a closer look at an important clan of the world of Degenesis that is not only connected to the city of Norit, but to Gusev himself. The Enemoi. The Enemoi are a Borkin clan traveling the wastelands in five giant UEO trucks that form a long convoy. Every colossal truck is adorned in blue and gray camouflage paint with eight wheels, each of them the size of a man on both sides. The largest among them is called the Citadel. It is as tall as a house and has two levels on the inside. The other smaller carriers are called Aquila, Fornax, Sagittarius, and Orion. When the convoy stops, marshallers wave their glow sticks for the drivers who form a pentagon out of their trucks. Steel arms swivel out into docking ports and link the vehicles. Support struts drill into the ground and supply stability. Inamoy climb on the roofs, tilting steel plates into position or pulling levers. They stretch a steel net across the quintangle, preventing attacks from above. Within 30 minutes, five trucks have turned into a defensive fortification that no known clan in Borka could conquer. As the engine turbines die down, quiet settles in. The facility can be entered via the Aquila. Those who come as merchants, or to ask for help, are ushered in. The Inamoi are also interested in buying any form of knowledge, books, stream glasses, or artifacts. This brings them into conflict with the Chroniclers, who have started imposing sanctions on any settlement that trades with the Inamoi. The clan also helps settlements against legions of outlaws, judges, and Anabaptists. Whether they are attackers or self-styled messiahs, the Inamoi as defenders of a bygone system of democratic values, do not tolerate them. They take on the role of lawmakers and defenders of this law in the settlements and judge outlaws if the clans do not want to face the wrath of the gangs. But they won't do this forever. Once humanity has managed to cast a majority vote for a new, united leader, the Inamoi will serve the newly elected head of a government. On many occasions, the Inamoi clan and the Chronicler cult have clashed with each other, especially the Inamoi's hunger for knowledge, which has been a thorn in the Chronicler's side. The Chroniclers have monitored the Inamoi's escape routes and have come to the conclusion that the Inamoi must have their HQ somewhere in the city of Norit. Gusev's domain, the Amsumo army, and forgotten bygone knowledge are out of reach. Legends about the cult's origin go back to the days of the Eshetan. Stories have been told about a convoy holding the world together when it had already started drifting apart. In the face of dire opposition, the people of the convoy took care of the survivors of the Eshetan, fighting and dying for order amongst an ever-growing amount of chaos. The aforementioned team of Spitalians trying to uncover the history of their own cult have discovered ancient delivery slips that showed evidence of frequent interaction between the Spittle and unregistered UEO support vessels labeled as the Convoy. The records show cargo deliveries to and from the Spittle, encompassing a time frame of approximately seven years between 2072 and 2079, and they featured medical supply drops, weapon shipments, and freighting of so-called blue granulate. One manifest file was the most cryptic of all, it was labeled Operation Fornax. It listed tens of thousands of cryogenically frozen embryos deposited by the Southern Ruhr Crisis Center 
and relocated to a secret UEO military facility within the perimeter of modern-day Norit. This low-profile delivery occurred on January 23, 2073, less than two months before the Eshetan. The paper is signed off, declaring the cargo as pure strain isolates. It is no coincidence that the mysterious pre eshetan Operation Fornax shares the same name as one of the Inamoy trucks. The Norit and Spittle connection also carries a lot of weight. The so-called pure strain isolates, the tens of thousands of cryogenically frozen embryos, were rescued by Gusev and survived the Eshetan, stored away in Bunker 12, a vast cooling chamber of Norit's underground industrial complex. Whenever it was required, the Marauder replenished the dwindling ranks of the original convoy by cracking the seals of the gestation units and delivering a new child into a dying world. We don't know much more about the original convoy or who started it, but it seems reasonable to assume that it was something like an early Spitalian project, initiated by doctors after the Eshetan to save as many people as possible. Gusev might have been one of the founders, and he definitely ensured the convoy's existence by adding new children to the dying ranks to replenish them. Raised by his decomposing hands, these children, the Inamoy, acted as the marauder's eyes and ears, his messengers and soldiers. Norit was their homestead, safe, free, a haven that they could retreat to after the chroniclers outlawed the clan and began hunting them down. The Forbidden City was their paradise, where Gusev instructed his progeny in the history of the world, taught them the secrets of the bygone age, and made them the sacred guardians of his realm. One of the Enemoi's objectives over the centuries of their existence was gaining access to more and more ancient data which they stored inside the truck called the Citadel. Inside the Citadel, the ancestors sit, staring at monitors, checking and sorting old data and adding new. In the Citadel's first floor, the Acolytes rest. In the red light, they look like hooded men with broad shoulders. But if you look closely, you see emotionless ceramic faces. The Acolytes are Amsumos. They are the heart of the Enemoi, linked to the truck's terminals and computer systems. They carry the knowledge of whole civilizations and know the position of bygone crisis centers secluded from recombination group facilities. Whether Gusev wants to use this knowledge to oppose Project Tannhauser or help humanity's survival isn't clear, but we do know that the Chroniclers heavily oppose this acquisition of knowledge. Not only have they set up Last Exit as a listening post to record any suspicious radio transmissions from Norit, but the fragment Omicron ventured into the city itself on a covert mission. The Chronicler fragment found Enemoy settlements that must have existed for centuries confirming the cult's suspicions about the Enemoy's HQ. But delving deeper, they realized the settlements were all abandoned. The Enemoy had left. What the Chroniclers don't know is that one of their actions dealt a decisive blow to the Enemoy. In the city of Mobilis, agents in charge of installing the new overhead cable system came across a curious sight. In the depths of the depot, Mobilis's main storage and distribution facility. They discovered an underground line snaking south, which had seemingly been active for decades. The chroniclers began following the cables, assuming that they had simply stumbled upon the remnants of an ancient connection to Cathedral City, the birthplace of their own cult. But they were mistaken. The power line circumvented the Anabaptist capital and aimed straight toward Norit. The Marauder Gusev appeared to be leeching electricity from Mobilis. How could this be? Who had set this up? There was nobody around that could explain it, so the only rational solution was to cut the link. When the ancient power line running from Mobilis was cut, nor its automated facilities fell dark. The production of blue granulate ceased, and the prosperous Elysian gardens that Gusev had planted and cultivated withered to dust. Finally, the cooling chambers began to defrost. The Inamoy desperately searched for a solution to save their father's idyllic kingdom, but there was none. Norit was isolated and doomed. There was only one solution, Exodus. 
The clan divided its last reserves among them, loaded the pure strain isolates into the fornax, and splintered across the desert wasteland. The crew of the Orion entered the Protectorate to divert the attention of the cluster by feigning a hostile attack. The ruse, orchestrated by Gusev, gave the Inamoy time to cross the Alps with their remaining trucks and reach Danzig in order to deliver their most precious cargo to Consultant Petrova. They traveled toward a new beginning. Since we don't know exactly what the Inamoy want in Danzig, we'll save conjecture for the future. But be sure that we will return to the precious cargo of pure strain isolates, Consultant Petrova, and her Hive research group in another video, which will focus on Homo Giantis. But the story of Gusev isn't finished yet. There's still more information about him and his actions, especially during the time of the City Wars. The City Wars also deserve their own video, but here's the short version. In the 25th century, roughly 400 years after the Eshetan, the so-called City Wars shake the entire Borkin region that would become the Protectorate. In the years before the City Wars, the city of Exalt rose to power in the region. Led by free spirit sleepers, its inhabitants raised a utopian society based on the values of self-determination and cooperation. Exalt swallowed more and more of its surrounding regions before Tannhauser agents began to oppose their hegemony. Shortly after the Exaltion warlord Coltrane sent his troops across the Black Lung Desert of Borka, Gusev appears as a player, sending out the Amsumos against Exalt's troops. Gusev is later wounded by one of Coltrane's generals named Trice, a free spirit sleeper who is still alive and hungers for revenge against the Marauder. Although Trice's wound never healed from the conflict, Gusev still searched for a cure for himself in the spittle at Danzig. Over the course of the City Wars, Gusev also supplied the Preservus, a secretive military organization among the battalions with Norit's hidden arsenal. Chemical compounds and biological weapons manufactured and stored in the depots of the Forbidden City. In hit-and-run operations, the Preservus spread canisters of artificial bacteria strains across Exalt's territory and poisoned its water supplies. Within days, Exalt's mercenaries were covered in black blisters riddled with fever and muscle cramps. Exalt would fall later that year, and Gusev could retreat back to Norit, wounded but alive. Currently, Trice is still hunting for Gusev and Aspera, who opposed her during the City Wars. She knows that Gusev supplied the battalions with the chemical weapons that dealt the final blow to Exalt's armies, and she is also aware of the cut power line that resulted in Norit's defense systems failing. She resides in Justician, planning her next move. Yet another chapter of Gusev and the Inamoy's journey can be found in the Numancer supplement book. The marauder Triglaw tried to inject his malware into the Minerva space orbiter on which he suspected Jerome Gattrell was staying. The marauder only managed to inject his malware into its peripheral systems of the orbiter via a weak hacking attempt powered by the subnet he had coated the Alpine fortress with. There wasn't enough processing power to deliver the final blow but it was enough to cause bedlam. The emergency protocols of the station ejected the virus-ridden shuttle from its mainframe, which came crashing down to Earth. The shuttle crashed into the city of Nolpelia, causing an already impending civil war to break out to full extent. The clan of Numancers emerged as winners of the brutal turmoil, and three months later, their scouts noticed armored carriages entering Nolpelia's territory on a freezing January morning in the year 2576. The colossal vessels came from the northwest, mobile fortresses striding on oversized wheels, the largest of them over two stories tall. It was the Enemoy convoy. Gusev was with them, as well as a unit of Amsumos, although they were coming with peaceful intention. Gusev wanted to investigate the remains of the fallen shuttle and bribed the Numancer leader, Katachin, and his people with crates full of seeds that would grow into highly resistant grain and thick walls of defensive thorns. The marauders searched the shuttle wreckage for several days, but
but left empty-handed. What Gusev was looking for were white ceramic cylinders, egg-like in appearance and barely larger than a human fist. They would probably be called an ellipsoid. The outer shells were designed to shield the interior from external stressors. Inside, they were tightly packed with glass storage cells with an inductor network that could be utilized as both power supply and interface all in one. Even though Gusev sensed the shadow of at least one such egg inside the remains of the crashed orbiter, he could not find it. What the Numancers didn't tell the strange visitor, though, is what they had discovered in the wreckage of the fallen star earlier. Instead, they hid their discovery in the former Meccan temple behind an enormous portal, secured by multiple hydraulic bolt lock systems where the marauder could not sense the ellipsoid. Years later, after the Numancers had repurposed the temple as their own, the priestess, Akaria, lifted the eggs from their vault to study them. With access to the original blueprints of the Mechanist, along with deconstructed paler sun disks and salvaged chronicler printouts, she began to realize that the eggs had fallen out of space at an inopportune time. These technological marvels weren't expected to arrive on Earth before the year 3073. Trapped inside were incarnations of a being, a being that had passed away and been long forgotten, but would someday awaken in a distant future to decide if its work had been fruitful or not. In conclusion, it seems that Gusev is the most human of the marauders. This might be the case because a short story is dedicated to one of his most significant moments really showing us the complexity of emotion boiling inside this being that is half a millennium old. Gusev is adored by the people he brought into this world, yet feels overwhelmed by guilt for his actions as a member of the recombination group. Feeling equal parts shame, responsibility, and burning revenge for Gatrell's betrayal, as well as a genuine desire to help a wounded human race, are all reflected in his character, and we can only wonder how he will influence the next chapter of the Metaplot, The Clan Wars. Thank you all for listening to this Lore Drop video by Pain and Paper. If you enjoyed what you heard, please consider liking the video and subscribing for more Lore Drops in the future. This has been Coop the GM, host of the Echoes of Eshetan podcast. It is a post-apocalyptic podcast set in the world of Degenesis and you might even hear some of the lore and locations discussed in these videos by pain and paper. So tune in every Friday on all podcatchers. All right, so I guess you know what you all got to do now. Huge shout out to Coop again. I think he did amazing. I really liked the episode, but I got to end with a question. And my question today is, do we know anything about Tricklaw, Gusev, and Aspera working together? They are all somehow connected to the chronicler cult but do they work together do we know any more about that if you do know more about that please comment and now people have a great one